Hi everyone, welcome back to the Mental Health Society's Community Conversations. If you don't know me by now, my name is Dana and I'm one of the executives and I also manage the social media. Today we have Grant McKenzie joining us and he's from our place. Welcome Grant. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're just gonna get right into it. So our first question for you is, for those who aren't familiar with our place, can you explain what you do? Yeah, our place is a community center for people who are experiencing homelessness, poverty, addiction, mental health issues, anything that leaves people kind of out on the street. Um, so obviously that's changed a little bit during this time of pandemic, um, but really it's about building community. It's about treating people with respect and dignity, um, giving people some hope and belonging, um, and really treating people where they're at. You know, that's a big part of it, is building that trust, building those bonds, and giving people um, some options like programs and services, and trying to get people to what the next step could be for them to, you know, improve their lives and reintegrate with the community. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important to be able to have somebody to reach out during this time, especially. That's great. Yeah. And how can people access your services right now? So right now, it's a little bit different um, because one of the big things that we do, of course, is we, we, we're serving uh, you know, 1,600 to 1,800 meals a day. And people would come into our dining room for that. Um, so right now, we're still doing all those meals, but we're now doing it as takeout service. So we're packaging it all up in the kitchen, taking it down to our front gate and handing it out to people. We're also giving people... Um, that come down to 919 Pandora. They can come down, we can escort them to the washroom, for example, or escort them into a showers so they can get a shower. Uh, we're also giving out clothing, uh, clean underwear, it's a big one, uh, feminine hygiene products, so all that kind of stuff that a lot of times we don't think about for people who are on the street with no access to laundry and things like that. So a lot of our services are still continuing just in a, in a different way. Our, our, Paramedic outreach workers, for example, are still out there every day connecting with people, communicating with people, because um, there's a lot of fears and worries and things like that that they have to address, as well as the overdose crisis. The overdose crisis, of course, you know, over the last three years has really changed everything we do here. The, the number of deaths and number of overdoses, number of overdoses we've seen has been just heartbreaking. So a lot of those services are still happening. Our programs, however, are of hit pause because almost all of our programs, and we had 60 programs here, but they were all run by volunteers. And so, and a lot of times they were run by elderly volunteers. So they have all self-isolated, they've all gone home. So none of our programs are currently running. And we're hoping that um, once COVID passes or once we get a, a vaccination available for everybody that we'll be able to resume that community center feel. Oh, that's great. That's you're still doing so much for the community right now. I so appreciate the work you do. It's amazing, honestly. Thank you so much for that. And what is the most common obstacle the homeless community faces when seeking support? I think a big thing, I mean, obviously um, addiction has been just an incredible hurdle. But what we're finding, um, we just recently at BC Housing bought the Comfort Inn, um, and we have, our place is, is running it. So we've now got 93 people moved in there over just the last two days and we're getting all that settled. But the big thing I think is that for some people, um, their mental illness, a lot of the mental illnesses we're seeing are so severe, but a lot of times, you know, mental illness can cause people to react violently and violence doesn't work in a community setting. You know, we just, in order to protect everybody, we really can't address the needs of a violent individual. And so they're kind of left on their on their own and that's you know that's really disheartening you know i think we really need to get you know no more money put into um, the mental health system to really look at the different levels of, of mental health that we're, we're seeing out there you know we've got some people who are very low needs and um, they're very stable doing really well then we have other people that have um especially you know with some of your you know, like severe schizophrenia, for example, or, you know, severe bipolar, and they're not taking their medications or they've never been diagnosed and have the proper medication. And so really dealing with, with that is so far beyond what, what not-for-profit 
you know, community centre can do. And so we really need the supports of, of those professionals, you know. So we work closely with Island Health and, and BC Housing, but I still feel it's really, that's the biggest obstacle, is getting the needs, uh, is getting people's needs met. Because some people are they're so far down the path, they're so far falling through the cracks that they probably would benefit from being in um, an institution for a while to get stabilized, to get away from street drugs, to have their needs assessed and for the proper prescription medication to, to balance them out. And a lot of times those, the, the people that are in that situation are just left out on the street and that's quite difficult. Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely an ongoing battle. And I hope even just like small things like this bring like a little bit more awareness to the people around us in our community, just so we can get a little bit more of a word out for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you suggest to somebody who is currently facing these obstacles? The big thing, I mean, we really believe that, you know, when we move people in, like there's always that fear and trepidation when we first, you know, invite people to come into the comfort inn for a room. And uh, just like we all experience when we go to move, you know, it's all, oh no. And so there's that. And so we have to really allay those fears. And that happens one on one, you know, really just when we introduce ourselves and we, we speak to people, you know, using our name and their name and getting them into that room. And we find that once they're in this, you know, beautiful room with a bed and a TV and a, their own private washroom, I mean, then we can really work on that stabilization factor. Then we can really check in on them a couple times a day, but really try and build that relationship, build that trust. And that's really the biggest way for people to get the help they need is for them to start to trust us and start to trust that we can connect them with the right resources um, that will help them. I think the biggest um, obstacle, of course, and we probably see this a lot with the parents of, of young men, who are on the street with mental illness and they're, you know, self-treating uh, with street drugs, is that it feels like a lot of times there are no good options for them. They tend to end up in the criminal system, which is the wrong place to be because it's a health issue, not a criminal issue. And so that, you know, that's that's a real a real struggle to find out exactly how we can help that individual. But the best way I would say to people is really make a connection with an outreach worker because they can cut through some of the red tape. They can get you, you know, the, to the positions that you need to be and to the right professionals. Right. Yeah. It's all about building trust and making them comfortable enough to share what they want. I totally yeah, think that's so. great. And what can members of the public do right now to help the homeless population? It's in this time of COVID, it's a little bit more challenging because, like I say, our programs have shut down. Uh, we can't accept used clothing at the at the moment, which is a real shame because we give out you know a lot of clothing to people. Um, so right now, for the general public, we're just we we are calling it help from home, and it really is just making a financial donation. And we are right now we're buying the underwear and buying socks and buying t-shirts and and so financial donations are really the right now. The best thing. Hopefully, once um, <clears throat> more restrictions get lifted, we can start accepting uh, used clothing again. Because I know lots of people are doing spring cleaning because they're at home, self isolating. So we'll be able to bring that clothing in and, and get it get it out to the people in need. Okay, great. Thank you. Due to the recent pandemic, many people are under and experiencing a lot of unprecedented distress. Do you have any self care tips or coping strategies that you could share with our viewers? Yeah, I mean, especially when I look at, you know, our outreach workers that are really working one-on-one -on -one with people. And, um, and and it's frustrating, but I find for a lot of, especially, our, especially the outreach workers, I find that when they get, really sink their teeth into what they're doing, you know, like when we opened up the comfort in, for example, that injection of excitement, here's something we can really do, here's how we can really help. Um, that really, you know, got them motivated. Um, but I think for the general public, it really is about taking this time to relax a little. You know, I think we all get pent up. Um, we all have worries and stresses. But I mean, I think if you're, if you're having that time at home, this is a great time to connect with people, you know, really virtually or, or by phone. 
but also to take that time for your self-care, take that time to just breathe and relax and realize that uh, we'll all get through this eventually. Yeah, I definitely know that I myself am sinking my teeth into a lot of work right now, which is keeping me motivated. But at the same time, I know that compassionate fatigue is like such a real thing. And I feel that our outreach workers are probably definitely being overworked right now and it's fantastic what they're doing it's great but they, yeah. i feel like they definitely need to take that time to themselves too to garden or watch a movie or something like that <laughs> yeah i mean because you know in, in our field the um you know covid is coming on the the heels and running in conjunction with the overdose crisis that we've been yeah. facing so that uh that stress hasn't eased up you kind of hope we're hoping for a little bit of a break and it hasn't, it's just accelerated, you know, so that's, uh, so self-care is very important. Yeah, absolutely. That's all of the general questions I have for you today. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add to conclude to this interview? I don't think so. Great. Yeah. Yeah, Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to everybody who is watching today. If you want to check out our place's website, for more information, that would be awesome. And make sure to watch our next interview Wednesday at 6. And thank you again, Grant, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Absolutely. And goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>